Alright, that should have been on the screen just long enough to make this awkward and uncomfortable for everyone. And now with that out of the way, with you guys' permission, I'm going to go ahead and wax poetic and philosophical on some controversial stuff. And uh, if I don't have your permission, oh well, I'm going to do it anyway. You can choose not to watch. Uh, but I'm going to say some stuff here that I've been wanting to talk about and say for a while. I actually had something come up today, a discussion I had with someone that, that gave me the incentive and the reason to go ahead and dive into it. So I'm going to. Um, this is something that, if you guys listen to me, if you actually hear me out from beginning to end, it may cause you to think. Uh, if you're open to thinking, you have to want to. Or it may cause you to block me out. That's fine, too. You can do what you want with the information. Um, but I also believe that there will be a lot of people who hear me out, and, and I'm simply going to upset you. Uh, I'm going to, if you're one of my fellow Christians, I'm going to make you mad. If you're a pastor, I'm going to make you mad. If you're a homosexual who does not believe in God, I'm going to make you mad. If you're a homosexual who does believe in God, I'm going to make you mad. If you're a homosexual who professes to be a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm going to make you mad. If you're a Christian who thinks that a homosexual can't be a Christian, I'm going to make you mad. Virtually everyone is going to get mad at, find something to get mad at me in here. So I would say, if nothing else, come together and unite over your hatred or dislike for me. Congratulations, I'm a united force. Uh, now with that said, let, let's dive into some things here real quick. So I was, uh, I was having a little talk with someone on Facebook and... Uh, basically, the conversation got started because they were suggesting, you guys might have seen this in the past, you may not have, I will put some links to a bunch of different resources with this video, whether you're watching it on Facebook or YouTube, I'll, I'll include some links to some resources that you can look into if you're interested in the topic. Uh, but, but the suggestion was basically that um, the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality, at least not the ancient original text. The Bible did not start talking bad about homosexuality until basically a few years ago. I mean, they first started out saying it was like the 1980s and it became earlier and er or later and later, I should say. And and um, so I, I took that to task and was like, no, that's that's not accurate. And 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 we'll talk about that. And again, there'll be resources that you can look to it in the video. But I also wanted to one of the things that I got to in this discussion was it's a straw man argument, really, it. it because what they're let's talk about the the purpose of the discussion really so the i was saying hey god's word has stood the test of time we haven't changed it 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 is what it is if you don't like god's word you don't have to like god's word the, i'm a licensed minister and i will tell you there's a lot of things in god's word that i don't like and you know why because they're not very convenient for me they work against me there's a lot of things that God says I shouldn't do that I do. And I think if we're honest, most of us can say that. This is actually a concept that I, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand where it became controversial to say that homosexuality is sinful or where that is bashing or, or hurting someone. And I found that, I've always found that interesting for a couple reasons. Reason one, we'll start with the easy one. A lot of the people who seem to be incredibly upset and offended by the concept that the Bible speaks of homosexuality being sinful are people who say they don't believe in God and don't believe that the Bible is, is the Word of God. Okay, so if, if you don't believe in it, why do you care what it says? Why are you hurt or offended that God doesn't like homosexuality if you don't believe in God? Do you care what Santa Claus's opinion is on something? Do you care how the Easter Bunny feels about something? So if you think that my God is just as real as those guys, why are you so bothered by what his opinion is? Let's start with that. The second thing I've always found interesting about it is I don't understand how saying that something is sinful actually became controversial or means that you're bashing someone or, or talking bad about that person, which this is a concept that we're going to get into this video in a lot. Because um, I talked about it with these people that I was debating a lot. But, but you see, if I say that, if I say that stealing is wrong, that's not, that's not bashing. That, that's, that's not saying that, uh, that people who steal are, scum of the earth and um, they need hellfire and brimstone okay it's not saying that 
It's saying that the activity is wrong. It's not saying anything about the people who, who conduct the activity, which we'll, again, come back around to this later, which, again, I'm going to give everybody equal opportunity to get mad at me. Okay, So, so be patient. You're going to have plenty of time to get mad at me in this video. Um, so, so here's another, uh, another issue here, is that when I was talking to these people, I said, okay, the Bible has, did not, you're, you're right if you're suggesting, because this is, they try to pick and, it's, one of the things that's interesting is, you can look at people who have clearly never read the Bible, and then are trying to tell you what the Bible says, which I think is kind of funny. Then there are other people who you could tell that they were doing what all of us try to do, which is basically justify our behavior. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. If you don't think you are, you're kidding yourself or lying. We all sit around and try to justify our behavior. And so, most of the people who were saying what the Bible said were, were clearly people you could tell who have never read the Bible. On the other hand, they were pointing to an article that was written by someone who professes to be a homosexual and professes to be a Christian. So he's a Christian homosexual. Now you can think what you want about that. Again, we'll, we'll dive into that later as well. But anyway, that's, that's who the article was written by. So let's just ask ourselves a question here. Do you believe that this person has a bias? Of course they do. We all do. But if, if, if I'm a Christian, and I have been taught that homosexuality is wrong my entire life, then it's going to make me uncomfortable if I'm a homosexual. Just like if I've been taught that stealing is wrong. If I know that I'm, I'm a thief, it's going to make me uncomfortable. When we get uncomfortable about being told what God's word says on, on something, we have really a, a list, of, a very, very small list of different options that we can choose. Number one, we can choose to reject God's word. Number two, we can choose to reject God. Number three, we can choose to stop doing what it is that we're doing. Or number four, we can choose to look for reasons why God's word doesn't say what we think what we were told it said or what we think it says or what what apparently is we'll start looking for ways to massage it or change it or or you know we're we're going to interpret it in a way that suits our own agenda and our own will those are really the only four things that we can do no matter what side of the aisle you come down on on any issue that's what we can do when we don't like what god's word has to say and that is not exclusive to homosexuality it can be any topic but we're going to talk just like i talked to them about why homosexuality is front and center on on these debates and why we stay focused there but i, I just want to say what you can do when you don't like what god's word has to say those are really the only four options that you can take now having said that so one of the things they did say was well the bible didn't say that homosexuality is wrong and this, well, if you want to look at it and say literally homosexual, it didn't say that homosexuality is wrong. Okay, the word homosexual was not in the Bible. So if you want to say that, then you're right. But if we're, if we're not talking about what the letter of the law is and the spirit of the law, which is what should be important to all people, we can't get dogmatic and we can't get legalistic about God's word. What should be important to any of us is just like, just like when we deal with other people. We shouldn't really care what that document says. We should care what the document means. When I'm talking to you in a conversation, you can slip up and say something. And sometimes we get confrontational about that. You'll see someone say, well, you, that's not what you said. What you said was, and a lot of times the person will argue the point. They'll say, no, 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 no. I, I, I did say, and they'll say what they meant to say. Even though if you play the tape back, an often case, and oftentimes, you'll hear that they did not say what they meant. They said what you heard. But I, I look at that and I say, why are we arguing about that? That's not what's important. That's an argument to see who's right and who's listening to the other because they want to do one-upsmanship. Aha, you said, we're all playing this gotcha game. And I think that's a terrible way to go through life. We don't need to worry about gotchas or exactly what it says. What we need to do is work on having an understanding and a respect for one another. If, if I sat down 
And I'm going to sit there and basically use your words against you. I'm going to sit. You, you'd better be awfully careful, right? You'd better be picking and choosing your words because I'm going to use them to beat you with. That's not a conversation. That's not respect. That's not dialogue. And that's certainly not seeking an understanding with someone. A much better and a much more mature way to approach people is to sit down and try to have an understanding with one another. To sit down and figure out where this person is coming from and why they're coming from that position. You'll get a lot more out of that, and so will they, than you will by sitting down waiting to swing the gotcha hammer. And so to those people who say, well, the Bible didn't say homosexuals, Okay, if you're looking for that specific word, whether it's in English or the other translation, uh, whether we're talking about the ancient Greek or Hebrew, whether we're talking about Leviticus or Corinthians, okay, you, get, you got me. You, you wanted your gotcha, you got me. It doesn't use the word homosexuals. But that doesn't mean that God's not talking, or the Bible's not talking, about homosexuality. Something else they try to do is they try to to change it, and again, you'll see this in the resources I share if you want to look at it, and, and they'll look and say where, it's, where we were taught, you know, the Bible says man should not lie. It sh man should not lie with another man as he does a woman. And they say, well, what, he, what was actually saying was young boys. We're talking about basically pedophilia here rather than consensual ad adult relations. No. No, you are doing some heavy spinning if, if you're attempting to say that. If we actually look at the ancient text, it says male to male, and there's no age referenced there. It's going to be male with a young male, male with a similarly aged male, male with a much older male. It doesn't matter. We're talking about same gender. It is clear from the ancient text that we are talking about homosexuality. Now again, if you don't like this, if you're bothered by that, I get it. There's the four things that you can do. You can reject God's word. You can reject God. You can try to look for some different way to massage the information to make it suit your agenda. Or you can stop what you're doing. Those are the four choices. Okay, What you do, what choice you make, that's on you. Okay, I will support your freedom to to choose any of those four options okay but they have to be fair only a couple of those options are actually fair and genuine if you're actually trying to understand and actually trying to grow okay but if you choose to walk away from it that's on you god says that's on you too he gave us this thing called free will you are free to make the choices you want now you might have heard this too you're not free from the consequences of your choices. You are free to choose. But when there are consequences for your choice, you don't get to go, well, darn it, that's not fair. Yeah, that, that's exactly what fair is. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Okay? That, that's, that's how fairness works. So if you make good choices and you get good results, that's fair. If you make bad choices and you get bad results, that's also fair. It may not be convenient, it may not be pleasant, it may not make you happy, but it is fair. Now, now that I've made, I'm sure, a lot of homosexuals and a lot of people who are, who are supporting the LGBTQ community, which again, I'm going to start making a lot of these controversial videos. Stay, stay tuned, you're going to have ample opportunity to be mad at this guy, trust me. But <clears throat> one of the things is, now that I've made those people mad, <laughs> let me go ahead and step on the toes of my brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? And l let me go ahead and, and uh, maybe step on a few pastor's toes here as well, okay? So, so again, in this discussion I was having with them, they came back at me and, and they were like, so again, it doesn't say homosexuality, so again, when you talked about this, I talked about what it's actually talking about. Are we talking about, are we talking about um, citing words here? Are we talking about the meaning of the, the content? That's what the discussion needs to revolve around, the meaning of the content. But after we did that, a concept that they kept coming back to, I could see it over and over and over in everything they said, and I wasn't really applying to it because I was trying to stay on the, con the, the, the original c concept of did we change the Bible in the 80s or 90s to make it say something that, that it didn't say before. 
Um, and so I was trying to stay on point, but they kept going to something that was a little bit off point, and eventually I decided, I think I need to address this topic. It's a big elephant in the room. And they basically were saying, well, it's, it, it's these verses that have been changed, which coincidentally were not changed. <laughs> God's word says what God's word says. Um, but it's these w- words that, that people use to bash, the homo- to bash homosexuals. And they kept say, pointing that out over and over and over. So eventually I decided, let's, let's address this, okay? So let's, let's get down and dirty, guys. Let's get deep. Let's be raw. Let's be frank. Let's be honest. Can I do that? So here's the honest thing. People who hate homosexuals, and there are a lot of them, there's not a person out there who hates homosexuals because the Bible says homosexuality is wrong. They might tell you that's why they do it, but it is bogus. We know it's bogus, and we're going to talk about exactly why it's bogus if we're in denial in just a moment. Okay? Okay, guys, I'm back. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Had to update my uh, webcam drivers and everything, but we're back in business. So, yeah, no hat now. Little things have changed. I'm going to continue on, at least try to continue on with where I was. Um, So, as I was saying before, There is no one who hates homosexuals because the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin. There'll be a lot of people out there that will tell you that's why they hate homosexuals. But we know that's bogus, and if we don't know it's bogus, we're going to reveal it right now. But first of all, let's just say something too. Even if they did hate homosexuals because the Bible says that homosexuality is sinful which, by the way, the Bible does say that homosexuality is sinful, that does not mean that the Bible is telling them to hate homosexuals. We need to look at what the Bible says, and then we also need to look at what they're doing. But let's be honest here. That's just justification on their their part when they say that. If they say that they hate homosexuals because the Bible says they hate homosexuality, then they should also you know, hate an 18-year-old boy and girl who have consensual sex on prom night. Because the Bible calls that sinful too. But they don't hate them. Let's look at the, the, the big word that's on the screen. You'll see it over there on the on the side. Uh, it's hard for me to, to get this going because these things are always mirrored. So, yeah, we're, you see where it says that one at the very far side there? Sodomy going down the screen. Okay, so we all know what sodomy is, right? And and let's look at sodomy, okay? There will be a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians out there who will tell you that it's gross and bad. Rather, it's two men doing it, or a husband and wife couple doing it, or two straight people doing it. There will be an awful lot of people who, who say that, that's e- that it's bad either way. And you know what? The Bible says that sodomy is wrong, so sodomy is wrong. However, however, even when these people will stop and tell you that it's wrong, there's an awful lot of straight, aka heterosexual Christian couples out there engaging in sodomy in their marital bedroom. And they will say, well, the Bible also tells us that uh, there's nothing taboo between a man and a woman who are married to one another and their bodies belong to each other. So they'll they'll rationalize and justify. Again, we all do that. Every single one of us is in the justification business. But again, if we're going to say that the reason that they hate homosexuals is because the Bible defines it as sin, well then we need to be hating an awful lot of people if if that's what we're actually doing. Obviously, we don't need to hate people. Hating is wrong. But they're not hating this unwed, legal adult, 18-year-old couple, boy and girl, on prom night having a little fun together. They'll still tell you it's sin. Most Christians won't stand up and say it's no big deal or it's all right. But they'll say it's sinful. They won't say it's okay because most of them did it themselves. Most of us didn't wait until we were married. And so... So when we say that we hate homosexuals because the Bible says that it's sinful, it's an excuse. It's justification. The reason you're not going to find a logical reason for hatred is because hatred isn't logical. It's emotional. 
Okay? <clears throat> it doesn't have reasoning. You just hate. But let, you want me to tell you the real reason that most people, most straight people, hate homosexuals? I'll tell you the reason that most straight people hate homosexuals. It's because it's, e it's safe and it's easy. Safe and easy. And what I mean by that is safe and easy for that person doing the hating. Here's how it works. <clears throat> this, is, this has bothered me as a Christian for years, okay? What we do is we seek to feel better about ourselves by comparing ourselves to the fellow who lives across the street. That's not the way holiness and righteousness works, and the, the guy who lives across the street is not your measuring stick. I'm not your measuring stick. If you can say, well, I'm doing as good as Jace or better than Jace, bravo, pat yourself on the back. doesn't mean anything. Jesus Christ is the measuring stick. How is our lives m m measuring or matching up to his? But, you know, what happens is basically the guy who smokes cigarettes, he says, well, it's not that big of a deal. At least I'm not an alcoholic. And the alcoholic says, well, okay, yeah, maybe I throw a few back on the weekends, but it's not like I'm sticking a needle in my arm, right? And then the junkie says, okay, you guys got me. You're trying to make me feel bad, and I get it. I'll own up to my mistakes. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, I've never raped anyone, right? Meanwhile, the rapist says, and I don't really want to be confronted with my sins. I don't appreciate this as uncomfortable. But I've never taken the life of one of my victims. And it goes on and on and on. I don't know if you guys see the point that I'm trying to make here. We all try to feel better about what we're doing by comparing ourselves to what someone else is doing. And that's why homosexuality, to hate on homosexuals, is a safe bet for a lot of straight Christians. Because we start looking at the plank eye syndrome, right? Jesus tells us, hey, don't reach for the speck in your brother's eye while you've got a plank, a big two-by-four stuck in the middle of yours. First remove the plank, then you can reach and remove the speck. Well, this is how it lo looks, you see. Like, if I have a problem with alcohol, I can't go tell my neighbor who has a problem with alcohol he probably should stop drinking. Now, technically, I'm going to let you know the secret. I actually can do that. I really can, but I'm not going to do it for two reasons. Number one, he's not going to listen, and he's going to call me a joke, just like everyone else. He's going to say, you know, you're a big hypocrite. And the other reason is, it would require that I take a look in the mirror and confront my own sin, which none of us want to do. It's not just alcohol to alcohol, though. I can't even go next door and tell the guy who does meth to stop doing meth. Because whether it's alcohol or narcotics, we're still talking about substance abuse. And it still hits a little too close to home. Because if I go confront him about his little drug problem, he can easily push it back on me and go, Dude, what about the 45 beer cans that are out in your lawn? When are you going to knock that off? And if he doesn't, someone's going to do it for him. Right? And so I can't confront him because I feel like I don't have a position to do that. And even if I had the position to do that, it means that I have to look at myself and my sin is not that different than his sin. They're very similar. But you look at sex, though, okay? You look at sex. Christians feel safe to point the finger there. Because if I'm a guy and I like girls, well, girls are different than guys, right? So, I can sit there and tell the, the, the gay guy he's gross and knock it off and all this stuff and the Bible hates that and God condemns it and you should just, oh, you're going to hell. Okay? Because I don't have to worry about that person going, what about you? Because I'm not sleeping with men. But see, that's the reason I, I used that 18-year-old prom night thing earlier. We don't do much of this. But I've confronted a lot of my Christian friends with that. It's not that different. We're still talking about sexual sin. We're still talking about fornication. And if you think that God approves of that more than he does the other, you're kidding yourself and you're telling yourself what you want to hear. God's not okay with either. He's not okay with it. So, you know, it doesn't matter if, if John wants to go sleep with Steve... Or John wants to go sleep with Mary, and Mary's not his wife? 
either choice, John is a sinful man, and God's not okay with it. That's the truth. That is the truth. But here's another thing. Again, we have gotten this idea in our heads that telling people, in this case I'm going to say the people that we're talking about, are homosexuals. We've gotten this idea, society has told us now, and, and the, the narrative that's running, is that saying that someone deserves to go to hell, or even is going to hell, is hate speech. I'm going to let you know on a secret. That's not hate speech. It's not hate speech. And I'm going to explain to you why in just a minute. And if you actually have your hearts and your ears open, it, ma it might make a little sense. But you have to be open to hearing it. But I'm going to tell you why it's not hate speech, okay? But before I tell you why it's not hate speech, I'm still going to tell you why I don't even understand the narrative from, a lot, from half the people. Again, half the people, more than half probably, who are bothered by this are people who say that they don't believe in God and they don't believe that the Bible is God's, God's word. They don't believe in the information. They don't believe in heaven, hell, any, so on and so forth. So if you don't believe in hell... Why are really why are you offended that you you're being told that you're going to go there or you deserve to go there? You know, it's not real to you. What why are we so offended and afraid of things that that we think are are fake and are imaginary? It it seems really weird to me, honestly it does. But here even if you believe the hell is real like I do and you believe that people are going to go there like I do, I'm going to tell you why telling people that they deserve to go to hell is not hate speech, okay? If, you're, if you are a homosexual male or female and you're watching this video and you're going, so Jace, are you telling me that you think I deserve to go to hell? Yes. Yes, I think you deserve to go to hell. Now right away you're appalled. You've probably already stopped. You're not even listening to the rest of this now. You're sending me hate mail. You're typing comments saying, hey, I thought you were trying to show some sort of uh, way that you're different and, and this, that, and the other thing. But no... Nope, you're an evil hater too. That that's that's what's going on if you're watching this video for most of you probably. You're not going to hear the rest of this. Here's why it's not hate speech. Yeah, you do deserve to go to hell. But guess what? So do I. I deserve to go to hell. If you're watching this video, you deserve to go to hell. If you're not watching this video, you deserve to go to hell. We all deserve to go to hell. That's actually the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel and why it is the good news is that we don't get what we deserve. See, I, I deserve to go to hell. I can't dodge that bullet. That's exactly what I deserve. That is precisely what I have coming to me if we do that whole cause and effect thing. The beauty is, I don't have to suffer for what I have done. Because the suffering has already taken place. Christ suffered for what I have done. And yeah, to make a lot of my Christian friends mad, Christ has suffered from what those gross gay people have done too. Christ died for the suffering of mankind, or Christ suffered for the sins of mankind. Regardless of who it was that did the sinning, he suffered for all of ours, gay, straight alike. Now again, I've said homosexuality is sinful. I'm not, I'm not dismissing that. I'm not trying to marginalize it, or minimalize it, or pretend that God's word doesn't say what God's word does. What I am suggesting to you is that we have to be honest with others and ourselves, okay? Let me tell you real quick about one of the other ways that this comes to play. My favorite verse in all of Scripture is James chapter 2, verse 10, okay? Now, if you ask most Christians what their favorite verse in the Bible is, 99.9% .9 of them are probably going to rattle off to you a verse that is feel-good and makes you happy and gives you those warm cuddlies. James 2.10 doesn't do that at all. James 2.10 kind of makes me feel terrible. Why is it my favorite verse then? Because of what it does and how it makes me look at others. Because James 2.10 says this. 
It says this, For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles in one point, has become guilty of all. We've broken every bit of it. Because you see, we like to look, because we do, again, like to play that comparison game and pretend that we're better than the fella next to us or the gal next to us. So we like to list different sins out. But that's not the covenant that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. The law isn't a, isn't a list of a bunch of different stuff. The law is one thing. It's being obedient to his will, whether we have done that or not. It's that simple. And once you have broken that covenant, the covenant is broken. It's, it's, it's just a contract, right? When you, when you violate a contract, if it has 15 tenants, you don't have to violate all 15 tenants of the contract to be in breach of contract. Once you violate one of those things, you're in breach of contract. It's the same way with us and God. The second I broke, messed up and broke one of God's rules, I broke them all. I'm guilty. I am as guilty as sin to stay on track here. That's why I don't do a whole lot of this. I'm no better than the gay fella. I'm no better than the thief. And even though we look at child molesters as terrible, and I'm a victim of molestation. Many people don't know this. Maybe the first you're hearing of it, I don't know. I was molested for five years when I was a kid. So I know how ugly of a sin that is and how terrible it is. I'm no, I'm no better than those who abused me. I am no better than my abusers. Because I'm a sinner still. I don't do the same sins they do. I sin differently. But because of James 2.10, even though I don't do the same sins, I stand guilty of the same sins. Because I, I broke it all. I broke God's word. I am wretched. So if you're watching this again and you're a homosexual and you're going, so you, you think I deserve to go to hell, really? Yeah, I do think that. Because I deserve to go to hell and I don't think you're better than me. I, I know that's it, it's kind of a weird concept because the homosexual community want, want to phrase it like, oh, so you think you're better than me. Is that it? You think you're better than me? And of course, they're using that as an argument because they know. Of course the other person's not better than them. But once you're going to use that argument, it has to be able to flip back the other direction as well. I don't think I'm better than you. But I also don't think you're better than me. We're all guilty. Every last one of us. We're all sinners. We're all in the wrong. That's the beauty of Jesus Christ. He said, hey, how about I love you enough to take on the punishment that you deserve for you? Sounds like a good deal. We say, well, what's the catch? He says, no catch, really. All I want you to do is accept the gift I'm offering. That's it. <laughs> that is Christianity. We talk about all these different things, and we can go in all these different levels. and But that that's Christianity right there. I just gave you the entire Bible summed up in a couple sentences. I screwed up. The penalty for screwing up is hell. Christ came along and said, how about I play superhero and save you from hell? I say, how are you going to do that? And he says, I'm going to offer it to you. I'm going to offer you a way out. And I go, okay, what do I have to do? And he says, you have to say yes. You have to accept my offer. And I'm like, there has to be something more to it. And he says, but there's not. That's it. You've got to accept my offer. I chose to make a decision 30 years ago to say, yeah, I accept that offer. That, that's it. That's Christianity. That's salvation. But you see, see, these people who are saying that they hate homosexuals because the Bible says, to, the Bible says homosexuality is sinful. No. That's not why you hate. You hate them, like I said earlier, because they're different and, and it gives you a chance to feel better about the sins that you, that you commit. 
You don't have to feel bad about cheating on your wife. You don't have to feel bad about punching holes in the landlord's wall when, when you were mad at him or her. You don't have to feel bad that when the guy came into your auto shop, you gave him a ridiculous quote because you knew he didn't know better. You don't have to feel bad that you lied to the, the guy at work about, uh, about dinging his car when you were backing up and it, telling him it was someone else and you saw them drive away. You don't have to feel bad about these things that you're doing because what you're doing isn't as bad as what that other guy's doing. God would say, yeah, it is. Truly, you're, you're just as bad. You're just as guilty. But you feel safe doing that because the sins that you're committing are different than the other person's sins. But different doesn't mean better. And different doesn't mean worse when you look at it the opposite way. Different just means different. So whether your sin is idolatry or whether your sin is adultery or whether your sin is homosexuality or stealing or murder or 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 same boat same boat to my homosexual friends I would tell you the bad news for you is that that doesn't mean that your sin isn't sin either your sin still sin that's the bad news and your sin is just as bad as the other people's sin and I know you don't want to be told that but it's true the good news is your sin isn't any worse and God still loves you it doesn't mean that it's okay to continue again we look at the we look at the, one of my favorite one of my favorite biblical stories it's not a secret to most people most people have heard it if you grew up in the church you have heard it a billion times if you didn't grow up in the church you probably still heard this story we're pretty much all familiar with it Jesus and the adulterous woman right and, and all these men got their little stones and getting ready to chuck this lady to death this harlot right and Jesus shows up Jesus shows up and he says let he who is without sin cast the first stone one by one they all put the rocks down and they take off as they're confronted again with plank eye syndrome and they realize that they are in no position to throw stones. Why? Because they don't want the stones coming back at them. Because that's the cost. When you sling a stone, you have to be willing to take a stone. And so they go away. Most of us know the story, and that's the way the story is told over and over. There's another part of that thing that we don't talk much about, though. That shows the mercy and the compassion and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, which is beautiful. But there's another small part there that nobody really hints on or, or, or drives home. We look at the, the story doesn't end there. The story doesn't end with Jesus chasing the mob off. It keeps going. Because he looks at the woman and he says, hey, do you see anyone here to condemn you? And she says, no. And he says, well, then neither do I condemn you. The story still doesn't end. Because then Jesus looks at her and says, now go and sin no more that's the key that's the mission that's the point the story doesn't end until he has shown compassion but then tells her the expectation is that she will follow same kind of thing here that's why homosexuals aren't off the hook when I show you the compassion and say hey you're no worse than they are doesn't mean it's okay to continue doing what you're doing. But for my Christian friends who are straight, same kind of thing here. I'm not letting the homosexual community off the hook. I'm not saying that what they're doing isn't sinful. But I'm saying, let's have a little fun game here. Let's sit down and talk about three things that you're doing right now that you know that you don't need to be doing, shouldn't be doing, and have been doing for years. probably won't be hard to come up with a list of three. I bet you it's not. Some of you might act like it is. <laughs> Can't think of three things, Jace. Yeah. Trying real hard not to, if that's the case. 
But then if, even if you don't want to, even if you could think of the three things, you're probably not going to do that because you don't want to sit down and confront your sins. So I say, okay, well, let's just do two then. Let's just talk about two things that you're doing that you, you've been doing and struggling with for the last 10, 20 years that you know you shouldn't be doing. You still don't want to do it, or you'll still be your little holy, pristine self. Nope, can't think of two skeletons in my closet, Jace. It's pretty clean. I can't think of two things I struggle with. And that's why, that's why I am better than this homosexual that you keep saying I'm not better than. Because he's living in his sin day in and day out. He keeps committing this sin over and over and over. It's habitual. I don't have sin that's habitual in my life. So you don't cuss every day? Or a couple times a week? Or once a month? You know, if you cuss once a month, every month, and you have for years, that's habitual. you got a habitual problem. I hope, Jason, I have a very clean mouth. I don't swear. Okay? We could play this game forever. You're never going to convince me, however, that you don't have some sort of sins and multiples of them. But let's say you win this one. I say, okay. We won't do two then. Let's just do one. My brother or sister... That's my challenge to you when you're watching this video. If you are a straight, heterosexual Christian, you're watching this, Jace's challenge to you is to think about that one thing, that one thing in your life that is causing separation between you and God. That one thing that's troubling you, that you struggle with, that you know you have no business doing and yet you keep doing. And my encouragement to you is to focus on you and your one thing rather than that someone else and their one thing. I'm not saying you can't say that sin is sin. You can do that. You should do that. We're supposed to hold each other accountable. But remember, it's remove the plank before you reach for the speck. And you might say, well, Jace, that homosexual thing, that's no speck, man. That's a plank. Okay, well, once again, you're looking outward rather than inward. This is the direction you're supposed to look. You're supposed to look at yourself. And again, James 2.10, I hate to say it, but I'll say it again, because I really don't hate to say it. You're guilty of the sin that you're telling them to knock off. Because you broke God's commandment. You broke God's covenant. So I'm telling you, stop worrying about them and their one thing, and start worrying about you and your one thing. That's what I try to do. I, I won't have any trouble. If you guys ask me in the comments, I'll, I'll let you know areas I struggle with. And you can pray for me. But I don't have one thing or two things. I don't even have three. I've got about 15 issues in my life. Maybe more than that. But I've got about 15 issues in my life where I would say are, I'm guilty of habitual sin. That, yeah, I'm a licensed minister. Yeah, I've preached in front of congregations of hundreds of people. But there are still things that I selfishly don't want to give up. Or maybe I gave up temporarily only to return to again later it wasn't a true repentance and it's not going to bring me any closer to God to worry about what about someone else's separation from God let's say my brother is gay okay worrying about my brother's sexual sin isn't going to prove my relationship with Christ. If I want to improve my relationship with Christ, I need to look at the things that I'm guilty of and work on those. Once I get it clean, maybe my brother will even listen a little bit if I want to go back and help him later. But I have to come from a place of love and compassion and a desire to help him, not a desire to condemn him. And then if you are watching this and you are a Christian who who is a homosexual or again some people are gonna tell you, you can't be both so let's say you are a homosexual who who says you're a Christian it's not for me to say whether you are or not it's for God to say but you have to let God be God and you have to give him the right to judge you you have to do that. You have to be open to his correction. And if you're not, then I would say that you're probably not a Christian. But the Bible makes it clear that homosexual behavior is wrong and it's sinful. So if you are a homosexual and you say, Hey, I bet on Christ. Christ is my Savior. He's Lord of my life. Then my encouragement to you is just like I 
talked about my straight friends a minute ago. Now I'm going to challenge you. Now I'm going to challenge you. You need to look at your one thing, this one thing in your life. And you need to ask yourself, how important is this to me? What is more important, this one thing or God? That's what the Bible means when it says you can't serve two masters. Maybe your homosexual partner is more important to you than God is. If he is, or she is, then God is not Lord of your life and you shouldn't say that, that he is, because it's a lie. But if God is more important to you and they are Lord of your life, then you have to look at your partner and go, what we're doing is not okay. And then this is where we get into a whole other discussion, which is where I'll kind of bring this thing to a close. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come down with this. Another thing that the, the homosexual community like to say is that love isn't wrong and everybody deserves love. And whether it's a man and a woman, a woman and a man, a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, love is beautiful and we all deserve that and we're all entitled to that, right? Well, here's the key. No. <laughs> Much like we all deserve hell, here's where it gets really ugly. None of us deserve love. None of us do. You know, and again, that sounds ugly, right? But here, it's not ugly. Listen to what I'm saying. Don't rush to be offended. Don't rush to be angry. Listen, it's actually beautiful. You don't deserve love. I don't deserve love. That's what makes love awesome. Love is a gift. You don't earn gifts. You don't deserve gifts. Gifts are something that is freely given to you without merit. That's why we all crave love. That's why we want love. That's why we covet it so much. Because it's this wonderful thing that we can get without being deserving of it, without being entitled to it. If, if you actually deserve it, you're not getting a gift. You know what you're getting? You're getting a wage. You're getting repaid. That's not love. Love isn't a wage. It's not payment for a job well done. It's a gift that you're giving, being completely undeserving of. That's what makes it special and beautiful. So let's start with that. You don't deserve it. And I can say that because I don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. That's why we all want it. But also, the, the other area that goes into is this whole concept about whether or not homosexuals are born that way, right? Right? We all talk about this. It's this important topic, except it's not. This is one of many examples I can give you of a straw man argument area that we're living in. It's not important at all. It doesn't matter whether you're born that way or not. I'm going to tell you why exactly here. I'm going to take the position that if you are a homosexual and you're watching this, I'm going to take the position, I'm going to back you up. I'm going to back you up. I've got your back here. I'm going to say, okay, you were born that way. Okay? Now, a lot of my Christian straight friends are really, really angry at me. And they have no business of being. Because they think that the same thing that you're saying, that if you were actually born that way, it's not a big deal and you're not guilty of sin. That's preposterous thinking. I'm going to tell you why real quick, okay? Being born that way doesn't mean that it's okay to do something. Some of, the, some of my Christian friends act like, well, they can't be born that way. Be, and they, they want to combat that because the homosexual community came back and said, well, we can't help it because we're born that way. And so we feel like we have to have some kind of argument against it because if, if we accept what you're saying, if, if one thing you say is true, then everything you say must be true. Or if one thing you say is false, then everything you must say is false. That's the kind of the area that we all work in. That's how bias confirmation works. I look at it and I go, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It's a talking point that doesn't matter. Okay, you were, you were born that way. Okay, great. I don't know why that's so hard for my Christian brothers and sisters to believe, because the Bible does tell us that we were born with a sin nature. I was born with a sin nature. I crave sin in my life. 
I crave sinful things. The example I always like to use here is that I suffer from greed. I do. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not saying it's not a big deal. It's a bad thing. I do suffer from greed. And I have to work hard to combat that. I try to help those around me. I try to help those in need. I try to give to those who don't have what I have. I try to take the back foot. A lot of times I put myself in worse position to help someone else out. Which goes against my greedy sin nature. But if I'm born that way, I can't help it. Just greedy. Ergo, it should be okay if I reach into your pocket and take that $10. Can't help it. I was born that way. Let's just let's keep on the object of sex and desire and lust and attraction and love so that I'm not picking an analogy that you go, oh, that's completely different. You're, you're, you're using false equivalency, Jace. Okay, I won't use false equivalency. I'll use equivalent equivalency. <laughs> How about that? Attraction is a natural thing. I got no problem believing that you're naturally attracted to some of the same sex. I'm naturally attracted to brunettes. That does not mean that I cannot have a relationship with a blonde or a redhead. And if I go seek a relationship with what my eyes naturally prefer, that brunette, that doesn't mean I have to sleep with that brunette. Doesn't mean I have to have sex with her. I can't help it. I was born that way. None of us were born having intercourse. We were born a product of intercourse, but we don't come out having intercourse. To engage in sex takes an act, a decision on our part. Unless, again, we're talking about sexual abuse. But you see, so I could sit there and say, well, I'm attracted to the brunette. Okay. Well, again, it doesn't mean I have to choose that person, first of all. And even if I do choose the person that I'm naturally attracted to, it doesn't mean we have to get down to business. I can avoid getting down to business. I'm supposed to avoid getting down to business if I ain't married to her. <clears throat> and so we look at this and we try to find ways to justify and rationalize our sin. There's no justification and rationalization for our sin. There's no justification or rationalization for hating someone else for their sin. And we have to decide if we're willing to let God be God. That's the truth. So, we didn't just the Bible talking about homosexuality being sinful isn't a product or an invention of the 1980s. It's not a product or invention of the 1940s. It's not a product of Martin Luther translating it. The Bible, God's word, has been consistent from the beginning that homosexual, homosexual behavior is sinful. And again, once we come there, four things you can do. Reject God. Reject his word. Massage his word to, to suit your agenda. Change your behavior. Those are the four things that you can do. Really the only one that's good is that last one. Change our behavior. We should try to become more like Christ. More like God himself. But if we don't do that, we don't have to do that. That is not the option that you must take. But as I said earlier, there are consequences for every, every one of those four choices. No matter which finger you choose, there are consequences. And you are free to choose any finger, but you're deserving of whatever comes with that choice. Truth. <laughs>